and I noticed that there were patterns whenever Dunleaf was involved in, a, in an attack. He followed protocol. And so this picture emerged of him as a man of honor, but a man who was carrying out the will of the Bora Council. Because of course the great meetings of South East Queensland continued on uh, long after white settlement. And those meetings up there near Baroon Pocket and the other big meetings at Bunyan Mountain National Park discussed responses to white people. What were they going to do? You know, they'd been, the white community had just been this con small confined settlement. But 1841, more people came. And it really brought out the sophistication of Aboriginal politics because initially the border made clear they wanted to try and negotiate, they wanted to trade, they wanted to get the benefits of white farming produce, white crops. Of course, everything changes in February 1842 when 30 to 60 Aboriginal people are poisoned at Kilcoy Station. And even then, the Aboriginal elders don't act immediately. Some do. There's some immediate responses, but it's very clear that there's not overall agreement until the next Bunya gathering um, in December 1842, January 1843. And that was a, the reason why I've drawn that conclusion is one other um, leading Aboriginal figure that many of you would probably know was a man who Tom Petrie called Milbong Jemmy, whose real name was Yilbong, and he had always opposed the white presence. And he'd consequently been punished by elders at times for his attitude. But after that, he's not invited to that big Bora meeting in Maroon Pocket until really late December. And he's so excited and he races off. And it's after that that there's clear uniform agreement that white uh, transgressions against Aboriginal law must be punished. And that's really the start of Dunley's warrior career. Before he was more or less an, an, an envoy or a diplomat trying to talk to whites. But then the Bora Council changed their mind and come up with a new strategy. And Dunley's first attack on a white person was actually a bit ineffectual. And he does it with another senior man who seems to be training him. And so uh, why he remains immensely important and why the whites focused on him was that he was going to abide by Aboriginal law and he was going to follow Aboriginal protocols whenever white people came on his country. And they knew that. And it really confined the white settlement. And so the story, undoubtedly the story continues after the British legal system thought they had dealt with him. Because of course, they thought if they killed Dundee that they would stop the resistance. And they didn't. Dunderley had been training young people, um, and uh, there were many others who followed Dunderley. And so, the, I don't know if you're aware, but the South, the Brisbane frontier, lasted 40 years, more than 40 years. They first tried to settle at Redcliffe in 1824. They still have to have a native police detachment at Sandgate up until the 1860s. And that detachment is not withdrawn till 1865. That means the struggle to control the suburbs of Brisbane lasted more, more than four decades because Aboriginal culture remained intact. Wherever there was uh, seclusion away from whites, then, the, then Aboriginal culture thrived. Um, and, and it worked independently uh, of, the, of the township. So it's a great story. It's a great great story of not just of Aboriginal political structures, it's a great story about a man who loved his country, who loved his people, who loved his culture, and who even when he was, and it was, you know, it's also quite interesting to see his response to the courts. He probably didn't know that the man who presided at his trial, Judge Terry, who would later be nice to become Sir Roger Terry, had actually been secretary to a British Prime Minister. But because there's a change in politics at home in London, Terry takes a position out of the colonies. He's initially solicitor general, he eventually becomes a judge. And it is Terry who tries several young Aboriginal men here in Brisbane. And repeatedly, Terry remits sentences. He says, no, the evidence isn't really strong. We should not sentence 
this young Aboriginal lad to death. But when Dudley came before him, Terry was in transit. And Terry, when he retires, so on to Terry when he retires to Great Britain and writes his memoirs, writes several pages about Dudley. He actually doesn't name him, but Dudley and the Mile Creek trials are only trials of Aboriginal people that this judge remembers when he's at home in retirement more than a decade after Dudley had already been executed. And it's very clear that the judge feared Dudley. Um, and he certainly knew that Dudley was contemptuous of the, of the trial and of the court officials and of the judge. And that's one of the factors that seems to drive the judge's uh, determination that where he could be compassionate and merciful to other Aboriginal people on this frontier, he, he decided no. This big, tall man, the tallest man the judge said he'd ever looked upon, was going to go to the gallows. And um, it's a horrible, brutal uh, hanging. Um, I think it's important to know how awful it was because it says so much about the British criminal justice system and what a brutal system was imposed on the Australian colony and the kind of convict, um, the, the whiteless convicts who were released onto the frontier districts who wreaked so much havoc on the frontiers. So it was white lawlessness and, and Dudley's lawfulness that kept striking me as I went through the records. Um, so it's a great uh, honour to be here, to be with other people wanting to remember this man. We need to get the white community to know this history, to know that if the capital city of a new colony of the British Empire took 40 years to subdue because of ongoing Aboriginal commitment to Aboriginal law, Aboriginal protocols, Aboriginal way of doing things on Aboriginal land. And I think it's so important that he join the um, pantheon of um, Australian war dead and be officially acknowledged, not just by the Aboriginal community that has never forgotten him, but also by the white community, that he did something that all Australians admire and respect. He died fighting for this country that he loved so much, and fighting for the people that he loved so much.